everybody. I'm Dr. Sarah Wooten, and I am your host for Dog Care On Air. And today our guest is Stephen Saital. Uh, this actually is the second time we have this amazing expert on our show because the first time he gave us so much more, so much amazing information that we just had to have him back. So welcome, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me again. Yeah, so, okay, so if you weren't with us last time, I definitely recommend that you check out the first video that we did with Steven Saital, um, because there's so much information in that. You can find the link for that uh, attached below this video. But let me tell you a little bit about this guy if, you, if this is your first time joining us. He is a registered veterinary technician, but he is so much more. This guy has more letters after his name than I think there are in the alphabet. I think he's using Greek letters at this point. Okay, so Stephen is, he is known in uh, my industry as a cannabis expert. And when we talk about cannabis, obviously we cannot be given t uh, large amounts of THC to our pets, but he is an expert in all things with CBD oil. Um, he originally started college to become a human nurse, but was really called to the animal health industry instead. So he became a registered veterinary technician and has obtained so many certifications with a focus on anesthesia and pain management. Uh, so his expert expertise on cannabinoids, he teaches at veterinary conferences all over the United States. I've been to his lectures. I've seen what this guy can do. He is an editor for a textbook on cannabis therapy, and he is also starting and participating in so many educational platforms for veterinary professionals. Uh, so we are so lucky to have him with us today. Uh, so the other thing he's known for in my industry is uh, he, he uh, welcomes people into his sessions with a little bit of salsa music, that right? It's true. true. So I thought we could maybe, you know, just play a little bit to kind of juice up this mood a little bit and get you us. Hear it? You hear it? Oh, I miss yeah. it. I do. So yeah. So I'm I just hope... dancing with people in my lectures. That was my favorite part, other than educating them, but that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome, Stephen. We're so glad to have you. So, um, yes, let's talk about CBD oil. We're going to just kind of, we're going to take a deep dive in because we covered a lot of the basics last time. Um, we talked about how CBD oil is being explored as benefits in many different disease processes, not only in pets, but in humans. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that with you today. Absolutely. So one of the main things I see pet owners uh, looking to CBD oil is for pain relief with chronic pain. So what should pet owners be looking for in products and what is it doing and why do they need to be paying attention? Sure. So when it comes to using, using things like CBD uh, for our patients, it's important to understand what kind of pain our, our pet has, right? So I think something that we forget about as pet owners and even veterinary professionals is we lump pain all into one big giant category, but really there's three different categories. There's what's called acute pain. So that's the type of pain you might feel immediately after a surgery or, or when you stub your toe, that's acute pain. It, it hurts really quick and usually goes away within a few hours, maybe a few days. Um, and then we have another type of pain called chronic pain that you talked about, which is stuff like osteoarthritis. That's that just unrelenting, always there kind of discomfort that our animals and certainly we can feel. And then there's another type of pain which kind of ties into chronic pain called neuropathic pain. And that's when we have specific nerve damage. So that's things like uh, neuropathic pain related to diabetes. That's if maybe you've had a, a limb amputated and, and maybe the surgeon wasn't as nice to that, those big giant nerve bundles that they have to cut through while cutting the limb off that can sensitize these nerves and, and cause permanent damage which is called neuropathic pain. So there's these three big categories of pain and it, it seems like these cannabinoid products, depending on what type of molecule from the plant is in it, 
is very effective for all three different types of pain, which is really exciting. Most of the research right now has been looking at the utility of things like CBD and some of the other compounds in the hemp plant uh, for alleviating discomfort associated to, to arthritis. Um, we do have some studies that are being done right now looking at the same types of products for acute pain. So like after a knee surgery, also known as a TPLO surgery, uh, there's um, uh, some studies going on where they're maybe, like, maybe going to utilize these in uh, uh, back surgeries in patients as well. Uh, but I think what we're really finding is for chronic and neuropathic pain, these, these molecules from the hemp plant specifically, because remember, we have to be careful the THC, seem to be very effective. And they're effective on multiple different levels, which is even more interesting because in veterinary medicine and human medicine, kind of the holy grail towards uh, treating something or providing care to something is using what's called multimodal approaches. So using multiple different things to help alleviate or cure a condition instead of using just one big thing. And an example of that, at least that we can relate to that maybe we've seen in the media is when it comes to opioids and things like morphine or oxycodone. We, we know we have this opioid crisis and we know one of the common reasons people are passing away from taking things like opioids is because they stop breathing. That's a, that's a well-known side effect of opioids for animals and for people. So when you use multimodal approaches using uh, different compounds from plants or different pharmaceuticals, we can lower these huge dosages that people want to take to alleviate their pain or even just to get high for that matter and reduce those, those dosages and it mitigates some of the negative or even deadly side effects that we see. So when we use products, full or broad spectrum products that come from the hemp plant, it has all these fun things in it and it works like a multimodal uh, um, uh, treatment plan, which is really, really cool and exciting. And we know, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, go ahead. And, and we know that osteoarthritis in particular is a inflammatory disease process, right? So we have all these inflammatory mediators. These are those little guys, the, the good guys and some of the bad guys, a lot of bad guys floating around the body that sensitize these little nerve endings that, that causes this discomfort for us and our pets. And so we know that if we can decrease those inflammatory mediators, which things like cannabinoids can help do, we will not have the sensitization as well as working on specific pain receptors. So is CBD being used in both chronic pain cases in animals and neuropathic pain? Absolutely. And is it also being used for acute pain? So it is being used for acute pain, but we don't have a lot of studies to, to support the true efficacy of that at this point. But anecdotally, yes, people use it all the time for acute pain. So I know that there's listeners and viewers of this that have pets right now that are suffering from chronic pain from probably arthritis because that is one of the most common causes of chronic pain in pets. And if a pet owner was going to be looking at adding in CBD to their animal's pain multimodal therapy, basically, so different types of therapy for pain, obviously they would need to work with their veterinarian, right? That's a given. Please. <laughs> But what could they expect? Like if they started using a product that is efficacious, does have in it what it, what it needs, how long would, honestly, would they be looking for to see any effect? And what would that look like to them? That's a great, great question. And when we start to talk about when these things are gonna take effect, uh, we really have to understand kind of the disease process that's happening. Like I said, with osteoarthritis in particular, it's an inflammatory disease state, right? So you have all these inflammatory mediators circulating, circulating around. Depending on how many of those inflammatory mediators you have circulating around, and then we also have to understand a little bit of the physiology piece. When your body is under chronic stress or disease states, there are more of these things called receptors that pop up all throughout your body. And that's called a proliferation of those receptors. 
And that can be a proliferation, an increase of these pain receptors also. And so if we're, we're taking a dose that's recommended on a bottle or on a box or even from the vet, um, that dose may be more effective for patients that are a little bit uh, less in this inflammatory state than these super inflammatory stated or state patients. That's horrible English, sorry. <laughs> I think you get what I mean though. Um, so if they have a super, super bad unregulated inflammatory disease, it may take a little bit longer. So I would say if you have a, a patient that is really, really, really uncomfortable, maybe it's on some other therapies, but it's still really uncomfortable, I would say give it a week or two. But if you have a, a pet like my pet, this is a perfect example. And I, I feel like such a failure as a veterinary professional, a pain expert and a cannabis expert, right? With my own pet, we're notorious for this. But I have this, um, this 93 pound deer hound and greyhound mix, his name is Diego and, and he's 11. And so it is not uncommon for older dogs to have arthritis. And I had always noticed his back legs, legs kind of quivering and shaking. And I was like, oh, he's just getting old. It's muscle loss, you know, we'll exercise him more. And then one day we, I was watching TV and I thought he had a seizure. And so I call my friend, uh, who's also a neurologist, Dr. Carrie Journey. I think you know her. And I was like, Carrie, Diego had a seizure. What should I do? Even though I know what to do, because all my training should kick in. She was like, you're the CBD expert. Why don't you put him on some of your CBD stuff? <laughs> so I was like, good point. I will do that. So I threw him on that. And I haven't seen a seizure, so I'm not even convinced it was a seizure. But what I did know was after a day, his legs stopped quivering. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have been failing my poor dog for the last year and a half as he gets older and is uncomfortable uh, by not providing in any sort of pain management for him. And so he's been, I, I've kept him on the CBD stuff for his, his comfort alone. And hopefully the seizure stuff, if that even was a seizure. But uh, that's, that's just an example of my own. <laughs> So that was in with that was within a day. It was it was pretty amazing. No judgment, Stephen. Yeah. No judgment. We learn. Yeah. We learn. We learn. Right. Just fail forward. Yeah. So uh, thinking about it, I mean, if if your dog is like overweight, um, oh, right, and has arthritis, well, obesity in itself is also a pro-inflammatory state. Absolutely. So. Would it take, do you, and does the CBD, like, does it get stuck in fat or anything like that? Can you help our listeners kind of understand, like, I know, because I see these patients all the time. I have a lot of patients that are too heavy for their, their weight. They have arthritis and the, 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 the person, the pet parent is just really frustrated. So, I mean, does the CBD get stuck in fat? How is it, how does it work differently in patients that are overweight? Absolutely. So being overweight is, is a huge challenge for, for many pet owners because we, you know, I'm Latino, so I like to show my love through food. Um, and so, <laughs> so it's not uncommon that, uh, you know, I want to share with him my delicious meal and, you know, that cannot be uh, in his benefit all the time. And, and as you said, uh, fat itself can definitely mess with our normal physiology. We know that when we have excess fat, we have maybe excess estrogen uh, circulating around, which can actually be uh, counterproductive to the effects that we're trying to get with typical pain medications, in particular things like opioids. So fat produces or increases or changes our hormone levels, which can interfere with drugs that we use to treat some of these other side effects, right? Um, so when it comes to CBD, uh, CBD, as we know so far, doesn't have a lot of negative interactions with some of the hormone changes we can see as it relates to fat accumulation. However, we also know that when your body, when our patient's body and our bodies absorb things like CBD or some of these other phytocannabinoids, the compounds from the plants, uh, and it's absorbed into our blood, it can get stored in fat. When it's stored in fat, it is what's, what's called non-pharmacologically active. So it's sitting in the fat, but it's not doing anything. You're not getting any benefit. You're not necessarily getting any negative side effect. When, however, when you stop that particular product or you start to lose weight, then it gets released back into the bloodstream and it becomes pharmacologically active again. Um, so that is something we need to be aware of. But thankfully, we know that CBD at least has a safety profile that is 
very, very extensive. So it doesn't concern me as far as like, oh, the, the fat's going to release all the CBD into my system. What's going to happen? That doesn't concern me. And so generally speaking, pet owners should be looking for some sort of effect. I mean, because with glucosamine chondroitin, I tell pet owners, you know, you need to be on this for eight Forever. to 10 weeks, right? Yeah. Before you're going to see anything, and you have to start with a loading dose. Okay. And if you miss a dose, then you have to go back to your loading dose. What's the deal with CBD? What, what do pet owners need to be seen? There are two trains of thought when it comes to, to dosing. So I talked about an inflammatory disease process, right? So when we have these super, in, super inflammatory states, it may be more beneficial to have a loading dose. So maybe I will dose it at twice the, the maintenance dose that's recommended for a week or two, and then I'll drop down to this maintenance dose but then there's some other patients like my dog, I think he was a good candidate. Like, I don't think his arthritis was severe enough to start with the loading dose. So I started low and slowly started increasing the dose to find that sweet spot that was really gonna work for him and what was gonna work for my, my, my wallet as well. Because some of these products, the good quality ones aren't cheap. And so if I'm using you know, uh, a double dose forever and I really don't need it, I'm spending a lot of extra money that I don't need to be spending uh, with no added benefit. Okay, so what about, what about cancer? That's a tough one. So I am going to, um, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the, the real talk when it comes to cancer stuff and what we know because there is so, there is so much um, hopeful but wrong information out there. When it comes to canine cancer, there's only been one study so far looking at cancer cells in a petri dish and, and utilizing things like CBD to kill those specific types of cancer cells. The specific types of cancer cells that were used in these petri dish studies were osteosarcoma, so bone cancer, mammary carcinoma, which is a breast cancer, and a lymphoma. And what the researchers, Dr. Joe Washlog, uh, found was things like CBD did kill those cancer cells really well compared to things like doxorubicin, which is a chemotherapy drug that's often used in veterinary medicine, did kill them very well. And really showed, again, that those broader, those full spectrum products, not the isolate products, so if you smell, if your product smells like cannabis, it's likely a broad spectrum or a full spectrum. That is not the only uh, uh, way to tell if it's full or broad spectrum, but that's an easy way. Uh, it seems to kill those cells better. With that said, there's a lot of research out there looking at the different profiles, the different cannabinoid levels, the different terpene levels in these plants and how effective they are in certain types of cancers. So one product might be really, really good at killing bone cancer, but it might actually increase cancer growth of a different type of cancer. Does that make sense? So it may be good over here, but it may be really bad over here. And we're specifically seeing that with THC. I think THC is the one that I hear in the media the most THC kills cancer. THC has been shown at least in five different cancers to actually increase cancer levels. So we have to be very, very careful. And I don't think the science right now is, is strong enough to say this particular product is going to be good for this specific type of cancer. We're just not there yet. With that said, lower dosages, so this is dosages of lower than two milligrams per kilogram, seem to be good at alleviating some of the negative symptoms we see with cancer. So things like poor appetite, right? So there's nothing more stressful to pet owners. And you know, even me, my dog was not eating last night. I was like, oh my God, he has bloater. He has a brain tumor or something like that. Just because my dog wasn't eating, I hate when my dog doesn't eat. So I put some crab meat in there and he was like, oh, I'll eat. I'm like, good, you have the capacity to eat. You're just not choosing to eat. Okay, that's fine. So anyway, increasing appetite or maintaining appetite. And then certainly animals with cancer oftentimes are older, right? So they, they have things like uh, osteoarthritis or they, they just are achy and old. And, and so we can alleviate some of those symptoms because there's nothing worse than having cancer and then also just being uncomfortable from something not related to the cancer. 
Yeah, sometimes I fe feel achy and old. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, what about uh, pet parents that have pets with um, anxiety? That is a, that's a huge, huge point of interest for researchers, pet owners, veterinarians alike. Um, and what we know so far is we, we know that these molecules, things like CBD, do help with the processing of, of anxiety, of stress in general. So I think in our last conversation, we talked about these molecules that your body produces called endocannabinoids that work on these specific receptors within the body. And then CBD also works with those specific receptors and even preserves some of those endocannabinoids which work on those receptors. So we, we know that CBD is working to help process and relay information as it relates to anxiety and stress. I think what we need to research more and, and learn more about is do things like CBD work like typical anti-stress drugs that we use every single day? And, and the, the answer is it, it's not looking like they are working the same way or, or very similarly, but they are really working in conjunction with. So like if I have a, a client whose pet is on trazodone, very common anxiolytic drug, right? Um, if I have a patient that's on trazodone and they're still showing signs of stress or anxiety, and maybe we're at that max dose of trazodone, throwing something on like CBD does seem to take that edge off that the pet owner was wanting to get. And because things like CBD actually help with the processing instead of just blocking or blunting stress effects like trazodone, over time, that patient and the brain and the receptors and all these crazy signaling pathways in the brain learn to process that stress and anxiety differently. So you can decrease the dose of trazodone and have them just on the CBD product, which is kind of fun. What about pets that are on MAO inhibitors or SSRIs? So SSRIs uh, and MAO is, is still kind of to be determined, but SSRIs in particular are, are drugs that are affecting serotonin levels in our body, right? And trazodone is one of them. Uh, and, and tramadol, which is a common drug that uh, a lot of veterinarians prescribe for pain, actually has SSRI-like effects. So whenever we use two drugs that work on the same uh, compound in your body and, mo and receptors in your body that are kind of competitive with serotonin specifically, we always get concerned about this thing called serotonin syndrome. A and basically serotonin syndrome will manifest as weird behaviors, maybe some weird breathing, and in worst case scenarios, not breathing and death. Um, which is never ideal. So there are drug combinations like trazodone and tramadol that are prescribed often that we just have to be extra vigilant about. And especially as, as pet owners, if you have a patient on trazodone and tramadol at the same time or other SSRIs, it's really, really important for us to keep a detailed record of our patient's behavior and, and talk to your vet, say, hey, my animal's acting kind of funny. Should I back off on one of these drugs? Because it, it could happen. And we see the same thing with CBD. We know that CBD has what's called affinity or some stickiness to those serotonin receptors as well. Uh, and that means there's a potential for serotonin syndrome. However, it's never been described in human or veterinary literature, but I think it's better to be safe than sorry, something we should always be acutely aware of. And it's always really important when you are talking with your local veterinarian that you have good records of everything that you're giving your pet and how your pet is responding. So keeping those records will really not only benefit your pet's health, but it'll help your veterinarian too. Absolutely. And, and, and Sarah, I mean, that includes things like supplements, things from plants. You know, I think people think that just because it's from a plant or it's natural, it's safe. That is so not true. Arsenic is completely natural and that'll kill you, right? So we have to be very, very careful. Just because something's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. So one of the main uses of CBD that I've seen other than osteoarthritis and pain is uh, seizures, seizure control. So can you tell us what's going on there and uh, what people need to know? 
I wish I could tell you exactly what's going on there, but the research is still <laughs> is still undetermined. Uh, it's funny because there is an, a, a CBD product that is FDA approved. It's called Epidiolex, and it will cost a, a pet owner around twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars a year if you wanted to go on it. So obviously, that's not going to be uh, very practical. But what some of the research right now is showing, and, and some of the research specifically for that product, is is the scientists are saying we don't really know how it's working, but we know it's working and we know it's safe. And in fact, before they put it on the market, before uh, prescribing it to people, they, they did test it on dogs and they went to a dose of 100 milligrams per kilogram, which is a ridiculously high dose, like don't ever use that dose, please, for 39 weeks. And there was some concern about the liver, but nothing that killed any of the animals, which is fantastic. But as far as its mechanism of action, we think that it is working on this receptor called the G protein coupled receptor number 55, um, <laughs> GPR 55. We also think it's working on these things called glycine receptors. We also think it's working on these things uh, called T cells uh, in the brain. And then of course, it's working with the endocannabinoid system. So th in all reality, it's likely working on all of these things and doing this elegant dance and, and working together to desensitize some of the hyperexcitability of some of these, these signaling pathways in our brain that can lead to epileptic events. Well, I've definitely seen uh, patients that, um, against my own medical advice, because right, I'm a Western trained doctor, they went off, they started ZBD and they went off of their seizure meds and they were seizure free for years. And so I was like, okay, well, we need to learn more about that. Yeah, my neighbor's done that. Uh, her dog's been on phenobarbital for six years and she's older and had some liver enzyme increase. And she was like, what should we do here? I'm like, well, we could try this and voila. <laughs> the, the conversation definitely needs to continue and we need to continue to learn how like this is actually interacting with the brain. So yeah. another, um, another thing people are using CBD for are skin problems. Tell us some more about that. Yeah, so as with anything, as with any of the, the new fad products out there, I, I hope CBD is not one of the fad products, especially as there's a lot of investment into uh, quality research surrounding it. But uh, one of the areas of interest, other than every other area of interest, is, is certainly skin and, and, and uh, decreasing some itch with like dogs that have atopic dermatitis, uh, cats with hypersensitive, hypersensitivity dermatitis. So there, there are two studies published now. Um, one of them uh, was co-authored by one of the, the authors that's writing for the textbook that you talked about in the, the beginning, Dr. Merigliotta in Italy, really cool guy. So what he did is he took normal cat skin and he looked at it under a special high power microscope and looked for those specific endocannabinoid system receptors and some other receptors that relate to the, the endocannabinoid system. And then he looked at cat skin that has hypersensitivity dermatitis. And what he found was, holy cow, there's like a four plus increase in these receptors in these irritated skin tissues. So what that's suggesting is the body is reacting. And if we can appease those receptors with these molecules that we can hopefully calm them down and they can go away and decrease that itch. And we see the same thing with dogs with atopic dermatitis. Right now there is a study in dogs that have atopic dermatitis going on at, out of New Jersey where they're using this, this product. And even though the results aren't released and published yet, hopefully they will be this summer, uh, it is blinded. So the doctor actually doesn't know which animal is actually on the treatment, but he definitely appreciates in some animals that, wow, something is working for these animals. Uh, and hopefully it is the CBD product because again, he's blinded. So he doesn't really know which animal is receiving what, but it's looking promising. That's really exciting because atopic dermatitis, as you mentioned, you may have heard your veterinarian call it atopy. You may have heard your veterinarian call it seasonal allergies. It's a big, big problem, right? We have a lot of animals out there with really inflamed allergic skin. And so this could be something really awesome to be able to help a lot of pets. So really exciting research. Um, and then the last, the last area I'd like to ask you about, Stephen, is the 
effects of CBD on um, stomach and intestinal problems? Yeah, that is a really, really good question and, and one that um, I deal with all the time with my dog because he's a greyhound and they just have sensitive GIs in general. So there, uh, there are now two studies in dogs where they did a similar thing like the skin where they looked for those specific receptors in that gastrointestinal tissue, right? And again, what they found is you can see an increased uh, number of those receptors and irritated tissues and, and normal amounts. And, and uh, there's one study now in cats identifying the same thing. And so the thought is, is if we give an, a product orally to our patients that it will touch those receptors and calm this inflammatory state down. There aren't any studies in small animals looking at that efficacy, but there are studies in people specifically with things like chronic, col chronic colitis or uh, Crohn's disease, where they are seeing good effect with adding mm -hmm. these types of products. So I, I, know, I know those studies are in the works. They just haven't been really, um, they're not far, far enough along to even give you hints on, on what we're seeing yet. Uh, but that is certainly something we see anecdotally great success with. Well, and are they inferring, so are, are there studies in humans with Crohn's disease and CBD? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Which is really, I mean, that's, that's really interesting to me because that is a human, huge human problem and the physiology of dogs and humans is similar in so many ways. Yeah. So definitely look those up. Uh, awesome. Well, a um, couple more questions for you, sir. <laughs> so if pet owners are looking for CBD products, we talked about in the last episode with Stephen, we talked about how to read labels, right? So go back, rewatch that episode so you know exactly what you're looking for so that you're giving products that are safe and efficacious. Because again, these products can be pricey. And so you want to make sure that you're getting your money's worth. But can you speak to the uh, whether you would recommend that people try chews, CBD chews or CBD oil? Sure. That is a great, great question. And it really kind of depends on your pet and what's going on and why you want to use these products. So let me talk about the science really quick. When researchers are looking at the absorption of things like CBD, what they've done so far is compared treats so the chews to the oil. And they've done four different dosing uh, techniques. So one is transdermal, so putting it in a cream and allowing it to be absorbed through the skin. Didn't work out so well. Uh, if you are gonna use those types of products, get one that actually has some science behind it, which pretty much there are none, uh, or only expect efficacy for uh, local regions. So if you had some skin irritation or something like that, like that might work, it might work. I'm not gonna put any promise there for that little area, but I would not, I would not uh, rely on what's called systemic absorption, getting it all throughout your body. And then there's the mindset that we need to put the oil under the tongue or in the cheek and let it kind of sit there and be absorbed. There are more studies showing that that, um, that is an effective means of getting it into the body, but the reality is, is after you keep it under your tongue or in your cheek, unless you're spitting it out, you're usually swallowing it. So then it goes into your stomach and you get what's called systemic absorption or, or oral dosing, which I think is probably the most supported way of delivering these products so far. Then there's this idea that we must do it on a fasted stomach. Uh, I've heard companies say, do it two hours before a meal, do it two hours after a meal. The science does not agree with that. That is made up. Um, <laughs> and in fact, what the science is showing is when you give these products, when you give the oil, or if you give a chew, because that is a food product, it gets absorbed into the body better than just the oil on a fasted stomach. So give it with food. Things like CBD are a lipid. They are a fat molecule. And so they like to hang out with other fats and then they like to be absorbed into the body with other fats. So give it with a meal. So any, um, so this is a lot of awesome science and a lot of awesome like debunking myths and like finding out what is what is real versus what is hype um you've given us a lot Stephen. thank you so much 
do you have any online resources that people can go to so that they can learn more and educate themselves? Oh, you bet. So I will give you some links so you can post them uh, like you guys did for the, the other uh, interview, because I think it's really important for pet owners to be able to have this information. I'm all about transparency, right? We as, as Americans, we as taxpayers of this country, fund a lot of the study through NIH grants or whatnot. So I think we should have access to this stuff. And so I'm happy to, to hand over some of that information. So pet owners can look at it and then certainly give it to their veterinarians because a lot of the veterinarians struggle with getting this information as well. And if you can come prepared to have this conversation with some of the data, I bet your conversation is going to go a lot smoother. Definitely. You as the pet owner are your pet's greatest advocate. So educate yourself, know what you're giving your pet and understand that you are in partnership with your veterinarian and you can come in with information and you can make choices about your pet. So, well, Steven Saital, um, I would love you to cue up some exit music for us. Uh, Steven has a website. It is, uh, the link will be below this video as well. So please visit. There's lots of good information on there. Um, you can actually contact him through his website if you have more questions. This guy, he is the real deal. I've known him for a long time and I'm so thankful for you taking time to come and speak to our listeners and for all of the contributions that you have given to our industry, including salsa music. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much. We will see you next time on Dog Care On Air. <laughs> Thanks for checking out our content. If you'd like to see more, Please visit our website at dogcareonair.com or any of our social media channels where we're uploading new content on a daily basis. Look for links in the description. And remember, dogs do so much for us. Learn to do the best for them.